But what we are giving them right now is a very different set of growth uh, conditions. The, the uh, temperature, the humidity, but more importantly, hormones. So plant basically for it to have shoots or roots, we emphasize on two main hormones. One is oxin, one is cytokinin. Now for oxin, we want to induce root formation. For cytokinin, we want to induce shoots formation. Now, if the concentration of oxin and cytokinin are the same, then callus will be produ produced. Callus are, in our terms, maybe stem cells. You know what stem cells are? Undifferentiated cells. So the usage of stem cells have been up for a lot of controversies. Because from the scientist's point of view is that stem cells are not differentiated yet. <coughs> so they are actually not any specific organs or any specific uh, life forms yet. But from ethical point of view, stem cells can differentiate to become an embryo, a fetus and a baby, right? So that's why stem cells is a life form, can be considered a life form. So from the ethical point of view, from the scientific point of view, there, there's a lot of controversies. So in plant analog, it would be callus. Callus are the undifferentiated cells. So we, we can actually use callus under suitable conditions they can be used to differentiate and form new organs, depending on what organs. Now, for plants, the organs would be like leaves, fruits, and things like that. Okay, those are the plant's organs. Now, this is one example of what we've seen from the video. From one mother culture, now this is mother culture, uh, sorry, ex, uh, mother, mother plant. So from one mother plant, we can actually excise a lot of tissues, a lot of organs, and we go into plant tissue culture, and then I'll go through the process later, one by one, step by step. And finally, it can be a plant on its own. But before that, of course, we have a lot of acclimatization processes. So we're going to talk about that. Now, this is just an example, a cartoon. Now, let's look at the uh, concentration of oxygen. This is the concentration of oxygen increasing. This is the concentration of cytokinin increasing. So as we can see, oxygen is for root formation. So if oxygen uh, concentration of oxygen increases, we're going to get a lot of roots. If the concentration of cytokinin increases, we're going to get a lot of shoots. But if the concentration of cytokinin and oxygen are the same, as in here and here, we're going to find, we're going to have callus. Okay? Now, just like any microbial fermentation, we have talked about the factors for microbial growth. AW, minerals, carbon sources, nitrogen sources, osmotic pressure, and so on, right? So for plants, it's the same. Now let's look at all the growth parameters. Growth media, we still need to give them food. So we still <coughs> need to provide growth media. Now the growth media will have its minerals, will have its hormones, but it will also have carbon sources. Then environment factors like temperature, humidity, now those will change according to the cycle of the tissue culture. It changes accordingly. Later you'll see why. Explant source. Explant is the mother plant source. So during selection of explant, normally we would want the younger ones, the younger plants. Because younger plants normally are less prone to carrying viruses and diseases. As they grow older, virus and diseases will move up sometimes to the meristem. But meristem can, can be a part where it is kind of protected. So we always want the uh, younger cells, younger tissues. Because viruses or diseases that moves, keep moving up the plants may not reach the younger shoots. We're going to look at meristem culture later. And then different species will also show different responses to the growth conditions. This is exactly the same with microorganism cells, right? If we have different type of bacteria, for example, they are going to grow very differently under the same condition, same medium. Just like human, we're all different, although we're all homo sapiens. But under different conditions, we will grow very differently, right? Now, types of in vitro cultures, now if we look at that, we can have shoot cultures, root cultures, or organ cultures. So basically, you can take from the shoot, the roots, or the uh, organs. Now, the videos that we have shown just now, primarily, which type did they select? The shoots. Remember, they cut off all the roots? So I, I, I'm very sure that some of you will be asking, what happens to the roots? How come they don't need roots? Because that was the first question that I asked when I read about plant tissue culture. But we will, we will talk about that later. Then we have callus culture. Callus are the undifferentiated cells. 
then we have cell suspension, then we have protoplasts. Later I'll show you some photos of what protoplasts are. Now these are colors, colors production. So these are colors and differentiated cells and then shoots coming out from colors. Now shoots can come out from colors if we give them the right media, the right hormone. So in this case, it will be the cytokinin. If we give it a lot of auxin, then roots will come out from the colors. So basically, we are inducing the colors to differentiate into different types of tissue cells and organs. So organogenesis is actually the selection of uh, organs. We can take different organs and turn them into different new plants. In the video just now, they were choosing shoots. So they're using shoots as an organ to grow into new explants, uh, new plants, not explants. Now, that is a faster way. We can, of course, start from cells. Cells grow into tissues, tissues grow into plants. That depends on our objective. What is it that we want? I remember two years ago, I brought a whole group of your seniors for a factory visit. And we've visited a plant tissue culture factory in Saramban. What they did was that they were doing uh, pisang, one type of bananas. So as you know, banana, banana plants only uh, fruits once. And after that, uh, the, the whole plant cannot be used. And the whole, imagine if you have one acre of land planting bananas, and the banana only bear fruits once. So after that, you will have to have new banana plants. And the soil, during growth, banana would use a lot of nutrients from the soil. So sometimes that one acre of land cannot be used for the next subsequent round of banana plants. Maybe we have to plant something else. Maybe potatoes, for example. One season of potatoes, and then after that, back to banana bananas. So there is a uh, huge demand for banana plants, actually. So how to have a large number of banana plants? It's, a, it's actually a huge business. If you're interested, you can start your own business. So that factory, well, they don't just grow bananas. They grow a lot of things. Uh, they were previously they were doing tongkat ali, katet fatima, katet fatima. Then now they that time when we went for visit, they were doing bananas. So what we saw the process. They they had uh, well, I guess that's why they wanted in Saromban. Land is cheaper, factory rental is cheaper. They they had the factory and beside the factory they have a whole big piece of land. So what happened is that they wanted banana plants. So of course it's not necessary f for them to start from cells or calus. They can take from existing banana explant and like the video just now chop it off and then uh, replant or in change media, keep changing media to grow the banana small plants. So after the banana small plants have been made suitable or acclimatized to the environment, then they move it to the next land, next piece of land where they actually planted and hardened off all these small baby plants. And then the small baby plants that are already proven stable, then they sell it back to the farmers. And the farmers know, oh, we really have a good stock of banana plants. And they can actually start growing bananas already. They don't have to wait for the uh, land to be uh, <coughs> refreshed or revitalized with nutrients before they can plant. So actually, plant tissue culture is a huge business. All right? So that's uh, organogenesis. Now, micro-cutting. What we've seen in the uh, video just now was sort of micro-cutting, micro-propagation. So they're actually cutting the plant in smaller sizes and then regrow again. So micro-cutting can be one of the uh, three types, nodal, shoot cultures, clump divisions. We're going to see some of it. Now micro-cutting, now this, this is one example of what we actually saw from the uh, video just now. Now the explant has buds, so we don't actually have to grow from cells or colors. We take an existing explant, cut it off, and then they has they, uh, the explant have buds, and they can already produce shoots. Like the, uh, video that we, should, we see just now, it already has all the shoots. It just cut off the roots and then it keeps growing in media for it to get bigger and bigger. So it doesn't quite need roots because we're producing, we're providing all the nutrients already in the uh, gel. Do you remember the gel that you saw in the containers? Those are agar. Agar with added carb suitable carbon sources, nutrients, hormones. Okay? That's why <coughs> they don't need soil because they are growing those plants in those agar nutrients agar already. So shoots are separated from explants and rooted, plant in new culture medium. So which was why we don't need all the uh, roots just now. That's what we've seen. Now these are the steps in micro cutting. So step zero, the first steps, is the selection of mother plant. 
Of course, you're not going to select a mother plant that is highly diseased. We will select a plant that is of good source. No diseases, no virus, proven uh, to, depending on our objectives, proven to maybe flower well. Later, I'll show you another video on why do we need plant tissue culture, not just for food production, also for exotic plants pl production. Uh, Rafflesia. Rafflesia is an exotic plant. We don't have it here. Maybe you can start a project and have plant tissue culture and we can have Rafflesia all over USM. But I think it, it may be because of the climate that may, that may not make it suitable or livable. Okay? So of course we want a mother plant that has no viruses, healthy. Uh, in Rafflesia's example, it can bloom well. We don't want a plant like my strawberry plants cannot bloom. No point having that, all right? Then after that is the initiation of culture. <coughs> so the X plant is actually placed in growth media. We want to get it uh, acclimatized. They are coming from soil. Then we want to put them into the lab. How many can survive? We have to make sure it survives. So we have to give it an acclimatization period. Then after that, the X plant is transferred or, or, or rooted depending, cutting on the organs or the tissues and put in a growth media. Here we call it a growth media. Because if we want it to have uh, roots first, for example, then the growth media will have a higher concentration of oxygen. So depending on the growth condition and what we want. Okay? So can it, it can be a shoot media or a root media. In this instance, it's a shoot media. So shoots can form. Then after that, uh, it's transfer, transferred to a root media. Do you see that um, the example that we saw just now. Every day, they will transfer a new batch of plant to a new media. It is not the same media. No, sometimes it is the same because the nutrients inside the media has been exhausted, so they transfer it to a new media and will grow again. But most of the time, all these transfers take place because we want the plant to grow in stages. They grow slowly, roots, uh, sorry, shoots. Then after that, we want the roots to form once the shoots are already mature. So we transfer to a new media with new hormones. Then there, the uh, shoots will start to be formed. And then X plant return to soil hardened off. Okay, we're going to talk about the hardening part later. Now, this is an example of meristem culture. Now imagine this as a plant source, all right? Now this is the tip of the plant. And at the tip of the plant, the, this is the meristem part. Now meristem uh, is very much desired for micropropagation, microcutting, plant tissue culture. Because like I've said, if there is a virus going up the plant source, normally it will go inside the plant uh, bottom up. So most of the time, it will, grow, it, it will go slowly as the plants grow. But most of the time, this meristem part will be protected because it's at the tip. So it's very unlikely for the virus to reach yet. So Meristem culture most of the time are used for micropropagation, but that is not the case, as we have seen. We can use other organs as well, all right? So this one has been put in growth media, and here, as we can see, they already have both roots um, um, hormones, shoots hormones, and then it can already have both roots and shoots. After that, harden off in soil, and then we can bring it back to the environment's condition <coughs> in bright sunlight. Now, these are the steps in micro. Cutting, we've already seen in a video, so we don't have to see it again. But pay attention to the uh, photo where you, have, where you see shelves and shelves of plastic containers all closed up uh, in white color agar with plants growing on it. This is exactly how the factory of plant tissue culture look like, the uh, plant tissue culture center. They will just basically have rooms, clean rooms like this, with shelves, shelves and shelves and shelves with all plant cultures, different stages, all growing. And inside this clean room, they actually control a lot of things. Control the humidity, control sunlight, control uh, um, uh, nutrients and, and, and so on, okay? Oxygen and so on. Now, this stage are zero and one. The selection of the uh, mother plant, which is very important. This, infects, uh, this infestation. Now, tell me, when we talk about microorganism, we have to go through sterilization of media, right? And normally we use the autoclave. Autoclave 151 degrees, uh, uh, 121 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes and 15 psi. And uh, whatever sources that we use, we can just basically dump it into the autoclave for sterilization. Now the plants, how do you ensure that the plant is sterile? Also put <coughs> it into the autoclave? No. 
Uh, we can. We can use laminar flow because of UV. We can do that. Uh, we can use EO gas, ethylene oxide gas. We can use uh, ethanol to actually swipe the plant. That is this infestation, basically plant sterilization. We don't kill the plant. Harsh conditions for sterilization for microorganisms sometimes do not apply for plant tissue culture. A lot of plant tissue culture materials like the four steps, the, um, uh, the glass battery dishes and things like that, yes, those can be autoclave. But the plant itself, we have a plant that we bring in from the environment, right? We have to make sure that it doesn't carry whatever contaminate, contamination sources or contaminants. So obviously, that's what we need to do. We still <coughs> need to disinfect the plant source. So that's how we do it, all right? Uh, I've seen um, using radiation as well, okay? Whatever measures that can disinfect but do not kill the plant. And then, of course, place in the media, nutrient, hormones, carbon sources. And one of the main carbon sources for the initial plant tissue culture is actually sucrose. It's actually a carbon source. So they also need that, not just microorganism. Okay, now, then multiplication of shoots. So if you want shoots to grow first, obviously we have your cytokinin, I have the cytokinin hormones. And as we can see here from the, uh, from the uh, photos, now this is the concentration of cytokinin, all 0 0.3 milligram per liter, and this is the concentration of auxin, zero, and it ranges. So as you can see, when the concentration of cytokinin is high, we can see a lot of shoots, right? And uh, let's look at auxin. When the concentration of auxin is higher than uh, cytokinin, we can see a lot of roots. But when the concentration are the same, then we can see colors. Okay. Now then, after that, after the roots have been formed, obviously we want the shoots. Uh, sorry, the shoots have been formed. We want the, the uh, roots to be formed too. And during this time is where we transfer the plant materials to a new medium containing oxygen. So this is where sh uh, roots will be formed. As we can see here, when the concentration of oxygen is very high, 10 milligram per liter, you can see a lot of root being formed, uh, roots being formed already. Now, after all of these have been formed, the next hardest stage is a hardening. This is where we really need to take care of our plants. So all these plants from calus, from cells or from tissues, they already grow into baby plants, right? Now these smaller plants will need to be acclimatized, made use to the other uh, environment where later on they will be grown. Again. You notice that in plant tissue culture labs or in their uh, clean room, the sunlight cycle, the, the light cycle is changed. So the plants maybe have a few hours of sun, then a few hours of dark. And then they will also have very high humidity. Now that is because plants, when they are small like that, and when they are cultured in a lab condition, they actually don't need to go through photosynthesis. Plants go through photosynthesis to build food, energy sources. But here in plant tissue culture, we are already providing them food in the media. They have all the hormones, nutrients, and so on. So there is no need for them to go through full-blown photosynthesis. And, but they still need to go through photosynthesis because later on, when they become a bigger plant, we are going to transfer them to the environment. They need to have the ability of photosynthesis. Now, be, another, another important factor is that when plants are grown in the environment under direct sunlight, <coughs> they would normally have a waxy layer on the leaves or they would be so used to the environment already that they won't get dehydrated. But in plant tissue culture, the leaves may not be waxy yet. They are still immature and we are growing them in the lab, lab scale, lab condition. So very easily, they can get dehydrated. So what happens is that in this plant tissue culture lab, normally we will control humidity. Usually it's more humid so that the plant cells or tissues <coughs> don't get dried off or dehydrated. But they cannot go on living like that. If we were to transfer them into uh, the real environment conditions, they will need to adapt, adapt to sunlight, adapt to certain, certain living conditions. We'll have drought, right? Not, not all places are like what we are facing right now for the past two weeks, raining nonstop. Some will have very hot temperature, drought, right, Gamara? So because of that, they will have to get used to that. So during this hardening period, acclimatization period, is where we acclimatize the plant slowly. 
for it to have the ability to go through photosynthesis, for it to have the ability to have uh, leaves with wax start to grow on that, and they, they acclimatize slowly so that it won't have a shock on them. And if we were to transfer these plant materials directly to the field, they're going to die. They will not survive. <coughs> so hardening is a period of gradual change in growth conditions, where they will actually get acclimatized to the real conditions that they will be growing later. All right? So many stages of um, acclimatization, changes in humidity, changes in sunlight. Um, but more importantly, they're going to be transferred to soil as well for them to, to grow. But are, we're not going to transfer them to soil and immediately dump them in the field. The soil condition can still go on inside lab condition. Then later on, transfer them to the real environment. So that was what happened in the factory that we, vi we visited, which was why they have a piece of land next to their factory for soil hardening. But that is not actually the real uh, environmental condition. It's still controlled, <coughs> like a glass house. You know glass house, where the plants are actually growing in a glass house. So those conditions are still controlled. Then later on, when the plants are confirmed to be able to grow well, then they are transferred to the uh, environment. Okay. Okay. So humidity uh, gradually decreases, so it's no longer that humid. The plants will have to get used to getting dry. Lighting gradually increases so that they have the ability for photosynthesis and so on. Okay. So new leaves with photosynthesis ability will be produced in the plant cells. Not plant cells, in the plant itself, before they, we, are, uh, we transfer them to soil. Now, features of micropropagation or microcotting and so on. Uh, clonal reproduction, uh, <coughs> multiplication stage can be recycled many times. As we can see here, we can actually, from one X plant, we can cut off to many smaller parts and then they can actually be grown into smaller plants. So one <coughs> X plant can actually produce many, many plants. Later, I'll have another vi video to show you. Easy to manipulate production cycles because all conditions are controlled. These three plants can be produced. Now this, this depends on the X plant. If the X plant that we show has a disease, obviously the, the rest of the offspring plants will have disease. If the mother plant is clean, then obviously under all these controlled conditions, it will also uh, have produce clean offsprings. Now, advantages of mo micropropagation, wait, before that, I want to go on to, I want to go back to this. Uh, okay, now this is what I wanted to show you on fungal contamination. This kind of contamination occur. In all industries, contamination will occur, but how big is it? For the industries, if the contamination is between 2 to 3 percent, it's all right. Anything more than 5 percent, it will be an economic loss already. Now, one of these gets contaminated. And we won't see contamination right after we micropropagate. We will only see contamination after incubation period, right? So during microcutting, you will get one plant source cut to many pieces and grow. If one of these is contaminated, there's also a high probability that the rest are also contaminated because it come from the same source. <coughs> so that is why we have to be very careful. Sometimes an entire batch is wiped off. So which was why your senior, who did her industrial training in a plant tissue culture lab, was very much um, highly, highly recommended by her boss, by her superior, because her contamination rate was less than 5%. And she's a trainee. No, no previous experience, no exposure, just like all of you listening to theories, no hands-on. So when she actually did have hands-on uh, exercises, her contamination rate was very low, so which, is, which is good. And uh, her boss was telling me sometimes some trainee would have cases like this, an entire batch have to throw because all contaminated. Okay? So contamination is one thing that you have to take care of. Everything would have to be done in a laminar flow, make sure everything is sterilized. For example, the VDA, they use glass bead sterilization. Not many people actually <coughs> have that. I don't even have that in my lab. We use a Bunsen burner. So you have to make sure that a Bunsen burner really sterilizes all your forceps <coughs> and all that. And as you can know, as you, you know, when it comes to fire, um, which part of the flame is hottest? Not the lowest part, all right? The, yeah, blue. They're all blue anyway. We don't use yellow flame. We use blue flame. <laughs> but which part of the flame that we use, the tip of the flame, uh, the uh, two-third of the tip of the flame, that's the hottest. So that is where we flame our forceps. You don't, you don't have the flame like this and you go deep down here to flame your forceps. This part of the fire is not hot. Right? 
So advantages of micropropagation, well, of course, we can have mass production of plants. Now, this mass production of plants, in our case, it will be for food purposes because this is a food bioprocess course. So it will be for food. So later on, a lot of my examples after this introduction will be on food production. But other than foods, micropropagation, plant tissue culture is also very important for, the, for plantations of plants that are going to extinct soon, plants that are very hard to be grown, micro uh, exotic plants. For example, I said Rafflesia. Later on, I'm going to show you another, uh, not Rafflesia, but another exotic plant. So larger production, beneficial during period of extreme weather conditions. For example, drought. Certain countries will have a drought period. <coughs> and during that drought, drought period, a lot of plants cannot be planted, cannot be produced. Now, if it's for exotic plants, maybe, maybe it's OK. But for food production, then the community or, or the population during that drought condition will suffer. So we, they still need food production. So plant tissue culture can be a source to that. <coughs> endangered species. For beneficial plants who are slow to propagate or grown in normal conditions. So plant tissue culture is good for that. Um, I will stop <coughs> at this because I want to go into a Q&A uh, discussion session. We will have that video for our next session when you're relatively bored. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions so far?